Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12324 in the name of Bob Doris on report and the consultation on the Scottish Government's draft national outcomes. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Bob Doris to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Uh, ten minutes generous, Mr Doris. Uh, thank you for your generosity, Presiding Officer, uh, and can I thank you for the opportunity to, to open this debate. What kind of Scotland we want to live in and our vision for Scotland we leave for our children are the key focus of the draft national outcomes. These outcomes, along with the Scottish Government's purpose from the Scottish Government's national performance framework. This framework was refreshed in 2016 and in late March this year, a revised set of draft national outcomes was laid in Parliament. The Local Government and Communities Committee was designated as the lead committee for considering these outcomes. I know that members were eagerly awaiting the publication of a report last week, which has the rather snappy title of Report on the Consultation on the Scottish Government's Draft National Outcomes. <laughs> How zingy is that, presiding officer? Uh, I know it sounds like a, a page turner, but these draft outcomes and the policies that will flow from them will impact on every single one of us in Scotland for many years to come. So the work of our committee and indeed the other committees who contributed their views to this report is extremely important. I thank them all for their diligent work in this area. It's fair to say that not many of us could object to outcomes such as, for instance, we tackle poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally, or that we grow up loved, safe and respected so that we, release, we realise our full potential. As such, the national indicators which would be used to track progress against these outcomes were equally of interest to the committee. Before turning to the committee's recommendations, I sh should set out the scrutiny approach adopted by our committee. The draft national outcomes were laid on the 29th of March, the last sitting day before April recess. The Parliament then had 40 sitting days to carry out the scrutiny. And as it happens today, the 40th day is today's debate, so we're just in the nick of time. What this timescale meant was that the Local Government and Communities Committee had to seek views, consider those views, take evidence and report by last week. Given the broad range of 11 national outcomes, I wrote to all committee conveners inviting them to consider those national outcomes that fell within their remit. In the time available, the Local Government and Communities Committee was not able to give any consideration to other committee responses, but we have published them alongside our report and they should be seen as part of the committee's report and form part of today's debate. Given this short scrutiny timetable, it is unsurprising that one of the committee's recommendations made by our committee, uh, not just our committee, a number of other committees I should point out, uh, was a plea for more scrutiny time in the future. Whilst the Act provides clearly for 40 sitting days for scrutiny, perhaps next time the Scottish Government might publish an initial draft well in advance of uh, the formal laying date so we can engage more meaningfully with communities and stakeholders before the 40 the formal 40-day scrutiny process begins itself. I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's views on how much more time might be provided uh, in future iterances of these national outcomes. Yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I, I thank Bob Doris for taking the intervention since invited. I will also write back to the committee, as would be expected of the government. But in that very specific matter, uh, can I say I am flexible? in regards to future timetables. I've complied with legislation that Parliament's been approved. I'm open-minded on even more time. Uh, but it's important to reflect on the fact that there's also been extensive pre-parliamentary um, uh, scrutiny uh, on this, which has helped inform the whole process that we're now undertaking. Bob Doris. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that's helpful, presiding officer. And, and I would note a report does acknowledge that there were 16,000 people attended public events across the country and 220 organisations with that engagement with the government. I think our committee would quite like to have some of that engagement with uh, Civic Scotland as well uh, when the, the outcomes are in draft form. So we'd like to be part of that process also. Uh, given these challenges, I am... Yes, of course. Game thank, Simpson. Thank Bob Doris for taking the intervention. Um, as, as, as committee convener, would you agree with me that uh, that pre parliamentary scrutiny is not the same as actual parliamentary scrutiny uh, and that parliamentarians should have had longer. Bob Doris. Um, I think I would just say as committee convener uh, it's laid down statute 
formally what parliamentary scrutiny should look like and the government abided by that. But our committee recommendation unanimously is we should go beyond that in terms of pre-parliamentary scrutiny and that's what we signed up to as a committee and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's agreed to look at that in the future. But there are challenges and given these challenges I am especially thankful to all those who responded to our call for comments on social media and to those who took the time to write to us with their views. I also thank those parliamentary committees who responded to us with their comments. In our report, we have called on the Scottish Government to respond to each committee on their comments and their recommendations. And hope the Cabinet Secretary will confirm today that he will do that, not just to our committee, but to, to other committees as well. The current setup of the National Performance Framework and National Outcomes is not new. The framework was established in 2007 and it created a 10-year vision for Scotland, which was then refreshed in 2011, then again in 2016 and reflect lessons learned from across the public sector and changing priorities in government. When the Community Empowerment Scotland Act was passed in this place in 2015, the national outcomes gained a statutory footing for the first time, which is why we're all here in this afternoon's debate. Under the Act, the Scottish Government are now required to consult the Scottish Parliament on any proposed revisions to the national outcomes and give details of the consultation processes that they carried out. Now, turning to my own committee scrutiny, Although most of the 11 draft national outcomes can be linked to the remit of virtually every committee in the Parliament, we identified three areas largely falling within our remit. Uh, two I have already mentioned in relation to tackling poverty and growing up in a love and safe environment, as well as the third one of we live in communities that are inclusive, empowered, resilient and safe. The views that we received were generally supportive to these draft national outcomes and the ambitions contained within them. It's hard to argue with them as a vision for Scotland. Having said that, our scrutiny of these three outcomes did flag up some issues which we have made recommendations in relation to and we'd want the government to address. So it seems sensible to start with the overall purpose stated on the draft national outcomes, which is to focus on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increased well-being and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. So that's the top line national outcome, if you like, that's the purpose. This is virtually the same as the purpose in the current national performance framework, but the words well-being and inclusive have now been added. Uh, during our scrutiny, we heard the views that the purpose seems to conflate both the means and the end. It was questioned whether the purpose should be to create a more successful country with opportunities for it to flourish. Increased well-being and sustainable economic growth would then be some of the ways of achieving that. So we're perhaps conflating the tools to achieve the outcomes with what actually the outcomes we want to achieve are all in the same uh, sentence. Uh, during our evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary, he explained that he was content that the purpose is expressed in a meaningful way and that it gets across what the Scottish Government is trying to achieve. Nevertheless, we recommend that the Scottish Government looks again at the wording of its purpose and separate these things out so that it can focus more clearly on the vision for the future of Scotland rather than both the vision as well as the roadmap for how to get there, the tools we have to achieve that vision. Turning to the national indicators, some indicators that are currently listed within the national per, uh, uh, performance framework are no longer listed under the new draft national outcomes. For example, the outcome around high quality public services has vanished completely. Yet, we all know that high quality public services is one of the government's top priorities. The committee are keen to ensure that progress against this outcome continues to be measured and reported upon in some way. Similarly, the Scottish Government has committed itself to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are a global agreed priorities for tackling poverty and inequality in UN member states up until 2030. Yet many of the indicators within the UN Sustainable De Development Goals have not been specifically included amongst the indicators in the draft national outcomes. Now we accept the Cabinet Secretary's explanation that the national performance framework is not the place to measure the delivery of all the UN Sustainable Development Goals, especially given that there's 232 indicators compared with 79 that makes it into the M NPF. We have, however, recommended that progress against the UN Sustainable Development Goals alongside the NPF outcomes indicators are made available in one easy, accessible place online, transparent and in plain English, so that anyone with an interest can track progress against them all. 
This is especially important given the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that revised national outcomes have been framed by the UN Sustainable Goals, something again the committee welcomed. Another concern raised with us was about how meaningful measurement of progress will be made in some indicators. So, for example, how can you measure loneliness or how can children feel loved? Uh, many people questioned just how meaningful these indicators were if you couldn't demonstrate a measurement of them. Uh, if I recall, I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary said a lot of that would be contained within the 2018 a national Household Survey, some, there would be some matrix in relation to measuring some of that, but a lot more clarity in how some of these things would be measured, I think, would be welcome. And during the evidence session, the Cabinet Secretary uh, told the committee that what is important to us as a society cannot always be measured, uh, but we'd still be able to express it, and if we can measure it, then we should try to do so. I think that's a reasonable position. We know it's the right thing to do, even if it's not always easy or possible to measure it. This is certainly a sentiment the committee can agree with, and we note that although these things specifically cannot be measured, there are other proxy measures which can be used to indicate process. So it's important that they're included as part of the national performance framework. As I said at the beginning of my speech, the national outcomes will impact on every person in Scotland, and it is therefore vital that this parliament is given the opportunity to provide its views to the Scottish Government. I, yep, just finishing off, presiding officer, I know that the Local Government Communities Committee will continue to monitor the direction and progress with them, especially as part of the new outcomes focuses on the budget scrutiny process. So it gives me pleasure to open this debate, and in doing so, I also move motion S5, S5M12324 in my name on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Thank you, Mr Doris. I now I'll call on Graham Day, convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land for Reform Committee, to speak on behalf of the committee. Five minutes or thereabouts, Mr Day. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the opportunity on behalf of the Environment Committee uh, to provide our views on the um, review of national outcomes. Uh, in practice, having just 47 days to complete parliamentary scrutiny of such an important document proved, from our perspective, quite inadequate, limiting, as it did, engagement with stakeholders. We wrote to 12 stakeholders seeking their views on revised national outcomes and proposed national indicators within our remit, receiving responses from seven of these. And those responses informed both our deliberations and interactions with the Cabinet Secretary and her officials when they appeared before us. So the committee did make best use of the limited time at its disposal, but self-evidently, and in the view of the committee, the scrutiny process would be more robust if there was a more flexible approach, or a more flexible approach could be deployed as has been discussed earlier. In considering the review, members looked at the three key existing national outcomes that relate to the remit of the Environment Committee, noting these have been replaced by just one. We recognise the desire to have focused outcomes. However, Scotland has, for example, world-leading research capacity, and this underpins everything we do. So we would welcome the Scottish Government's view and the call for re-inclusion of research and innovation within the national outcomes before the framework is finalised. We also looked at the national indicators to track progress in achieving the revised environment national outcome, and these too have changed. The committee has a number of recommendations on the indicators. We ask that the Scottish Government give further consideration to including a climate change adaptation and mitigation related indicator and an indicator of resilience from a climate change adaptation perspective. The committee also heard calls for Scotland's carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions in consumption to be a national uh, indicator. We'd welcome the view of the Scottish Government on this and on how it might be calculated. We'll be considering the climate change indicators for greenhouse gases and carbon footprint and the target against which to track progress within our scrutiny of the forthcoming climate change bill. Uh, we heard concerns about the absence of an indicator in relation to land ownership uh, by type. Some thought this was a missed opportunity in light of the renewed policy emphasis on land reform as a driver for sustainable development in Scotland. The committee itself had concerns in relation to the indicators for the green economy and resource efficiency, and we'd welcome further information as to why the indicator relating to growth in the green economy was not included, why there's no resource efficiency come a circular economy indicator, and why the indicator to increase renewable electricity production has been dropped. The committee has recently completed an inquiry into air quality in Scotland, uh, and we would welcome further consideration of the need for and the benefit of including an indicator that assesses the reduction of pollution and the impact of this on the health of the population. The committee will be focusing particularly on the marine environment over the next three years, 
and there are three additional indicators associated with this. We consider the health and cleanliness of the marine environment as a priority, and an overall assessment of the marine environment requires additional indicators. However, we question the usefulness of an aggregate indicator for Scottish seas, as this could potentially mask problems in specific locations. We sought assurance that the Scottish Government reporting on the sustainability of stocks will focus on specific issues and areas of concern, in addition to reporting on the general trend. While the new indicator relating to sustainability of fish stocks is an improvement, we wonder whether it alone is sufficient to pr in providing a good indication of the health of Scotland's marine environment. We understand the biodiversity indicator is to be revised to include uh, terrestrial and marine biodiversity, and we welcome this. However, uh, we note there is no clear descriptor for this indicator, and we're disappointed that this has not been included in the review. The committee explored how the outcomes and indicators will be measured and what further work is planned in relation to this. We are concerned the proposed draft MPF does not specify targets, and we consider it could be improved by better connecting the outcomes to the underlying targets. More work needs to be done to ensure indicators are more specific and measurable. The committee expects to see environmental indicators embedded across all outcomes, and we welcome the alignment of the NPF with the Sustainable Development Goals. We encourage the Scottish Government to consider further opportunities to connect the NPF more closely to the SDGs and reflect this in the final framework. The, uh, do, do the member's time? in his last minute, but yes, no, I'll, I'll let you make up the okay, time. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. It's just to make the point before this turns into a trend, the sustainable development goals are absolutely aligned to and fundamental to every aspect of the national performance framework. And I think all members should be aware of that. Mr. I, Day. I, and I, I, I thank the minister for that clarity. The, uh, the committee considers it would have been helpful if the review had clearly set out the criteria used for assessment of the indicators and recommends the Scottish Government include this in the future review documents. But overarching all our consideration is a concern that reporting progress in meeting the indicators on an aggregate basis may, and I stress may, mask problems or issues in particular areas and in meeting specific targets. So we would welcome an assurance that information on specific areas of concern will be highlighted when reporting on indicators at an aggregate level. President Officer, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Day. And I call on Gordon Lindhurst, who is convener of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, speaking on behalf of the committee. Mr Lindhurst, please. Uh, five minutes also. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me begin with the bard, uh, not that one, the other one. Because, to paraphrase from Twelfth Night, some are born niche, some achieve nicheness, and some have nicheness thrust upon them. The Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee is on rather a run here. Whether we are natural-born anorak wearers, I will leave for others to judge. <laughs> I will leave for others to judge, although that can be dangerous. But earlier this year, we completed an inquiry into the joys of economic data, and our 90-page report is the talk of the steamy, in the statistical community at least. Currently, we're looking at European structural investment funds, the regulations for which are 600 pages long. Now, that's just nuts. N-U-T-S. Nomenclature of territorial units for statistics, or nuts for short. Thank you to the officials for my copy of the mere five-page jargon buster. And then along came the opportunity to consider the National Outcomes Consultation. How could we resist? There are three areas I would like to cover from my own committee's perspective. Consultation, alignment, and national indicators. CBI, SCDI, and Women's Enterprise Scotland provided input to the consultation. What is unclear is the extent to which the views of the wider business community were sought. For example, how SMEs, the mainstay of the Scottish economy, were encouraged to have their say in this consultation. Those who were consulted said they wanted something simpler, shorter, and more accessible. That the number of indicators has gone from 54 up to 79, therefore raises a collective eyebrow. How will the Scottish Government ensure that tally is manageable and meaningful? The second area is alignment, which is a bit of a buzzword. 
since the Enterprise and Skills Review. A key role of the new strategic board, chaired by Nora Senior, is better aligning the enterprise agencies. We're told that covers prioritization, avoiding duplication, reviewing performance, and encouraging joined up thinking. It can also mean clarifying terminology. Pinning down the meaning of inclusive growth, for instance, has been something of a hobby for the committee. Last year, the chief economist said there was, and I quote, no single measure, that it was multidimensional, and again, quote, challenges you to look beyond GDP. Nora Senior told us in February, there is a discussion to be had on the definition of inclusive growth and whether it should focus on gender, geography, or generation. And on the first of this month, Keith Brown informed us the fundamentals were distribution, equity, and fairness. I trust the enterprise agencies are all following this and indeed are following all of this. A further aspect of alignment concerns the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The Cabinet Secretary described them as a fundamental building block of the national performance framework. His officials said reporting of the main goals will be done through the Scotland Performs website and the annual budget statement. Our question, particularly for devolved policy areas, is whether the Scottish Government intends to report on progress in a disaggregated way from the United Kingdom. And the third area is national indicators, the level down from outcomes. Our concern as we move away from previous time-based purpose targets is impact and measurement. What will the benchmark be? And how should policy be tracked and monitored without a time frame? Uh, in the words of Montesquieu, success in the majority of circumstances depends on knowing how long it takes to succeed. The NPF is seen as an international leader for approaches to well-being and public policy, but it remains merely a means of improvement, not the improvement itself. That said, we welcome the aspirational dimension of the national outcomes and NPF review. In the data inquiry, we called for a more agile, imaginative, and ambitious approach. The national outcomes must be an integral part of that. The principle being to consider not only what is readily measurable, but what could more usefully be measured. Measure what we treasure, as the Carnegie UK Trust put it, because what might seem a niche topic can shape decisions. And as I come to my close, we are back where we started. And I close by saying, with decision making comes accountability. And you don't have to be an anorak to work here, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it can help. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, I'm just getting over anorak uh, references there. Uh, can I call the Cabinet Secretary, please, to open for the Scottish Government. Eight minutes, please. I know, Presiding Officer, you're in awe of Gordon Lindhart's use of poetry and bard in setting out the evangelisation for the National Performance Framework. Uh, me too, Presiding Officer. I, I was thinking which bard he was going to use, so I could only think uh, fast enough of Rabbi Burns in relation to the National Performance Framework, and then I'll make the connection. If only, Lord, the gift to give us the powers to see yourself as others see us. Why is that important eh, and not scripted, eh, of course, is because we, uh, we, uh, we, have engaged, we have engaged comprehensively with the public to establish what the public, yes, and the parliamentary process that I have followed and gone beyond my statutory uh, requirements in that regard, but engage with the public to establish what kind of country do they want Scotland to be. And we just didn't leave it to the self-selecting people who may complete every survey. We went out and we, we went across through the great work of Oxfam um, UK and the Carnegie Trust uh, UK as well, commissioned them to undertake the exercise for us. And it was certainly, yes, things that can be measured, whether that's economic uh, growth, but absolutely inclusive uh, economic growth. And what came across though is a sense of, of well-being and, and kindness that people want to ensure that we inst instill in our society as well. So yes, this is about actions across society, but also the cultures that we create too. 
And the first national performance framework, over 10 years old, changed how this government did business, changed how we, we helped direct our, our, our agencies and departments and work with partners as well, such as COSLA at local government and others. And I have to say that so far the proposed national performance framework has been exceptionally well received by environmental organisations, human rights organisations, uh, many others, and not least COSLA as well, who have unanimously backed the proposition that we are putting forward. I, I accept, though, that um, more parliamentary scrutiny, more than the uh, 40 days as proposed, would be welcomed by Parliament, and I've already said I'm open uh, to that, but let's not diminish the pre-parliamentary scrutiny with the community groups, the stakeholders, and incidentally, the cross-party uh, forum in which all political parties in this chamber were represented and have been uh, for the last while, totally engaged on the direction of travel, the consultation exercise, and the process that I was undertaking as lead minister. I appreciate the local government committee has been the lead committee, and I am very grateful for the work of, of all the uh, committees, and I'll respond uh, shortly to that. Of course, the National Performance Framework sets out the vision, purpose, uh, how we intend to uh, deliver our outcomes and uh, the measurements uh, that we will use, recognising that not everything can be uh, measured. But it's the sense of culture and collaboration that I think has helped transform the way we do business within the public sector. This purpose, this National Performance Framework, actually goes uh, much further. It is a purpose and a vision for the whole nation where we can try and collaborate uh, all partners and stakeholders, private, public, third sector, uh, to align our efforts to create the kind of country we want to be. And Bob Doris is right. The, the outcomes are, are, are beyond objection. But that's because of the nature of collaboration we've had to arrive at those. Bear in mind, the first time a national performance framework came about, there was absolutely minimal parliamentary scrutiny. This is a far enhanced process. Up for refinement, absolutely. Improvement, absolutely. But this is a far better engaging process than anything we've had before eh, in that regard. And as for the new indicators, I'm unapologetic for some of the new indicators that we are proposing to insert. There's an interesting balance in the chamber already between those that argue for fewer or the same number of indicators and then other conveners who have said, have more. Why haven't you included certain other Indicators. So there has to be an appropriate balance of that which we're measuring for the purposes of the framework, whilst recognising, as the local government convener has appropriately uh, done, uh, that many measurements will still be undertaken but reported elsewhere. And I know that Andy Whiteman will probably make reference to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, would be right to do so, but I want to um, impress upon members the point again that they're absolutely aligned and fundamental. Some of the indicators we have already met are clear, such as basic sanitation, and are more appropriate to other nations than Scotland, so our focus need not be there, but on the other things where we know we've got far more progress to make, gender inequality, for example. And that's why some of the new indicators and measurements are so important, representing the progress we want to make as a society, child well-being, happiness, ability to influence local decisions, and importantly, an engagement with the trade unions, work-related ill health. So these are the kind of new and improved indicators that I think speak to our purpose and the values that we want to express. Our 11 new national outcomes describing what we want to achieve and then in an open and transparent way setting out the progress that we make towards that. And again, I believe I am content with our purpose, not just adding words for their own sake, but defining our mission around well-being and inclusive growth is, in fact, world-leading. And this government, indeed this parliament for those efforts, is internationally recognised. And that's why when we launch this uh, framework, I think there will be a great deal of international interest, just as there was for the Inclusive Growth Conference that the government hosted uh, earlier uh, this year with attendees from other governments OECD and the IMF. So people are watching very closely in our strategy here, recognising that we want to deliver sustainable economic growth, but in a fairer, more progressive and more inclusive way. And well-being is, is indeed multi-dimensional, but we are clear that we want to align all our public sector agencies, the private sector and wider society to, towards 
uh, that uh, goal. Now, I've had particularly constructive working uh, with local government and the trade unions, uh, with the charities uh, involved, and we have already uh, relied upon the extensive consultations from the earlier Fairer Scotland and Healthier Scotland consultations, which amounted to not just tens of thousands of participants at public events, but hundreds of thousands of people engaged and reached online. So not the consultation churn that we always go through, uh, where we sometimes go back to the same people, but drawing upon the range of engagements that this government has had with Scot a Scottish society. And it is interesting to note that 220 organisations were invited to our consultation activities to ensure that we left no stone unturned in identifying what the priorities are for the people of Scotland. So I know that Parliament and committees will ask us to do more and will rightly probe us on what we should be reporting and trying to achieve. But I do say this eh, to Parliament. We are substantially aligned so far on what we want to achieve as our purpose and the outcomes for our nation. Let's not try and find ways to divide us over the process because what we are trying to do is in a cross-party, cross-sectoral way, set out what we want to achieve for our country so that we can positively align all our efforts to create a fairer, a fairer and a wealthier society in which we've tackled inequality in a cohesive and confident manner. And in that regard, I look forward to the rest of this debate this afternoon and in presenting the complete national performance framework to the Parliament and to the people of Scotland. Thank you. I call on Alexander Stewart to open the Conservatives. Seven minutes, Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be able to participate in the National Frameworks debate this afternoon as a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee. And I'd like to acknowledge the work of other committees that they've done to support this process this afternoon. These national outcomes are the Scottish Government's broad policy aims, which are part of the National Performance Framework, which sets out Scotland's Government's proposed and provides a way of holding the Scottish Government to account against their own stated aims. The national indicators are a high-level measure which shows the Scottish Government and how it is performing. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, these new outcomes are slightly more vague, they're more ambiguous, and that gives me some cause for concern about this because it may prevent effective scrutiny of their performance. Now, what we do want is effective scrutiny of performance. These outcomes were set, as we've already heard, in 2007, with other outcomes added in 2011 and again in 2016. The Scottish Government chose to seek these views in phases uh, of gathering opinions from the general public and from experts within the range that it involved. And we've already heard today that tens of thousands of individuals have engaged and hundreds of organisations. Now that's very encouraging that we have that kind of support and we have that kind of mechanism. And I do very much welcome that. And these include stakeholders in lots of different organisations, adults, young people, as well as Scottish Government officials and ministers. With the consultation asking for people's views on what kind of Scotland they wanted to live in. Now, that's a good question to ask. What kind of Scotland do we want people to live in in today's society? Uh, and it's important that we out understand these views and we reflect on them and we charge them and we challenge them. There are 11 national outcomes, but with regard to local government committee, there were only three that we were involved in considering. And these were, we live in communities that are inclusive, empowered, realistic and safe. Very good. These are, these are uh, all we should take on board. But once again, I think they are slightly vague and they can be quite ambiguous. To tackle poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally. Yeah, no one can disagree with any of that, but it's how that's managed and how that's affected. And to grow up love, safe and respected uh, so that we can unlock our potential. Yes, exactly. Everyone should have the opportunity to unlock their potential. But it's quite difficult to gauge what love is and what safe is uh, in some of these situations. So it's important that we understand that. Deputy Training Officer, these are all well and good but it can and it does, and it's difficult sometimes to equate some of these due to the fact of the ambiguity that we're looking at. These new outcomes... Yes, happy to do so. Cabinet Secretary. Would Mr Stewart not agree with me, though, that sometimes some things are worth expressing even if they can't be measured, such as kindness? You may not be able to measure it, but if the people want it, 
if there's a joint aspiration towards it, then it's still worth saying. These are all Alexander aspirations. Stewart. These are all aspirations, Camp Secretary, and nobody would deny that. But when you're trying to manage and put into, into group uh, and organise what you want to achieve as a government and as a nation, uh, that's very difficult to equate. So we need to do more to make that happen. And I hope that you will consider expanding that whole process. These new outcomes show a shift by the Scottish Government away from hard targets to more vague promises. This government, were, if they were committed, they would welcome the serious, rigorous scrutiny to determine the success. In fact, these challenges give the impression that the government doesn't want to be held to account as much. Happy to do so. Cabinet Secretary. Can, can Mr Stewart give an example of an indicator where he believes we're trying to be vague rather than deliver progress? An exact example. I mean, Mr. Wait a minute, that, Mr Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I've said already, you, you have got lots of indicators out there that want to see prosperity, that want to see things happen. But they can only happen if you deliver and you put funding behind all of that process to make it happen. Moreover, it is increasingly important that any challenges to the national indicators do not mean that they are no longer care comparable with the previous indicators so that we can look year upon year to see that there is actual progress. We in the Scottish Conservatives are also determined to in ensure that the majority of indicators and targets that are there, and we talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, who have been indicated, and they are very important that we realise that na national income comes out from that. While the Scottish Government might argue that they have gone beyond what is required by the Community Empowerment Act in terms of the provision of the details. The draft outcomes and indicators, the fact remain that 40 days of consultation period was seen as insufficient. Uh, and others have indicated that it's inadequate. Uh, so, but, but, but at the same time, I think a cabinet secretary, if you intervene, it would be helpful because you're com No, you'll no, have no, to I ask. Think, no, I've already you'll taken two. I want to continue. I want to continue. Excuse me. Excuse me a minute. Heckling doesn't help. Mr Stewart, on you go. You're stirring it up a wee bit. There we go. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm passionate about the whole process, so therefore I want to ensure that we have a, we have a good debate today. But as I've said before, you know, it, it, we've, been, we've been told that it's inadequate, and that is something we must take on board. The committee has recommended that the Scottish Government take steps to extend the timescales of parliamentary scrutiny on uh, the next draft performance framework. And I request it, and I, much, I really do support that. In recent years, Audit Scotland has highlighted concerns about the extent to which public sector bodies contribute to achieving national outcomes. Many public sector bodies have failed to include national outcomes in their reports, and this has made it difficult to determine what impact their activities and their expenditure are having on national outcomes. It has therefore been encouraging to hear from the Cabinet Secretary the commitment to ensuring that future national performance framework is fully embedded in the public sector. While the inclusion of reference to the poverty within the national outcome is of course welcome, I like many others, I still feel it's a bit ambiguous. The Child Poverty Action Group has questioned whether tackling poverty is a fact an outcome or it is a suggested that there is a means to which we can achieve er eroding poverty. The outcome also does not make reference to the drivers of poverty and its limited approach. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, we welcome this opportunity to debate the committee's report to the national outcomes. Despite certain reservations about the new draft outcomes, we welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to ensuring that the national performance framework is embedded within the public bodies. I hope that the, the contributions from the debate today will lead to the Scottish Government confirming that the data protected by the national outcomes will remain comparable. This will ensure that progress against the national outcomes can be properly evaluated by this Parliament. That's very important. So can, to conclude, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I thank all those who've participated. I look forward to hearing the rest of the debate uh, and welcome the involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought peace must have broken out when I wasn't looking. I call, I call James Kelly to over for Labour. Mr Kelly, you've got six minutes, please. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll, I'll do my very best, Deputy Presiding Officer, to... Uh, support the consensus approach. So I, did, I, did, I have noticed, noticed this afternoon that I, I do feel the cabinet secretary is a wee bit grumpy at times with some <laughs> of the, the, the contributions, which is not, not like him, it has to be said. Um, anyway, uh, 
On to, to the debate, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the debate on the, the committee report. Uh, I want to commend the work that has been carried out, not only by the local government committee, but all the committees of the parliament in terms of the, the consultation which has taken place on national outcomes, and also the, the work of the round table and the, uh, the other consultations that took place pre this parliamentary consultation. I think that, that's important. As Bob Doris said, um, this is not the, the national outcomes is not a, a recent uh, measure that's been introduced. It goes back to 2007 when Scotland Performs was introduced and the idea behind it was there was a feeling at that point, 10 years, uh, sorry, eight years into devolution that, you know, vast sums of public money were, were being allocated in budgets, but they didn't have any measure as to how, uh, how that, whether that was being successful or not in terms of outcomes. So that was the, the, the genesis, of you like, of the national outcomes debate that we're having today. And I think it's, it's very much welcome. Um, in a previous life, before I became an MSP, I was a business analyst. So I welcome the fact that, you know, we have measures, we have evidence, and we look to assess whether the, the public money that we are investing is achieving the sort of outcomes for all the issues that we debate in this parliament on a week to week basis. I do think that from that point of view, uh, this work is absolutely essential. In terms of some of the outcomes that have been uh, set up, I don't think anyone can disagree with the fact that we want to see people well educated, we want to see people healthy, and we want to, to do things like tackle poverty. I think crucial to this is that there's got to be uh, a really strong link to the budgetary process. I think there remain massive challenges for the Scottish Government in terms of the budgetary process um, and delivering you know, properly on outcomes. Uh, and I say that because there's now a £40 billion um, budget and I think there remains a culture around budget, not just in the, in the Scottish Parliament budget, but you know, I've seen it in the private sector as well, uh, where budget holders will try and hold on and defend their budgets so that when it comes round to the, the budget review at uh, December, January, they will want to defend the amount of money that they've been allocated in previous years. And sometimes budget holders uh, do not have as their primary purpose looking at what the outcome that they've been given the, the money to deliver. And I think because of the number of budget holders that the Scottish Government budget has, uh, that is, uh, is a, a challenge in terms of changing that yeah, culture. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, thank Mr Kelly for taking the intervention. In, in flowing on from, from that point, would Mr Kelly agree with me that then there is a requirement for all public services, wider than public services, but public services at least to align around that outcomes focused. It should be transformational uh, around focusing on outcomes, not just inputs, but equally we have a responsibility in Parliament to focus a bit less on inputs as well and more on outcomes also. James Kelly. Yeah, I absolutely endorse that, appro that approach of it's not just about inputs. Uh, we need to change the debate in terms of outcomes. I think the, the changes to the budget process that have been made are helpful. I think a more longer term uh, view, longer term cycle in the budget process uh, would help. And I acknowledge that there's a, it's incumbent not just on the government but on all the political parties to, to change that approach. Because the, the other thing I would say is that absolutely fundamental to all of this um, is that we actually need to, to change the way that we do the debate. You know, if we really want to change outcomes, then it means, we need to, it means that we need to change that debate. You know, so for example, on health, you know, the reality is that on the ground, uh, certainly people in the area that I represent are struggling at times to get GP appointments. People uh, are struggling uh, with, are, are left on the waiting list for longer than, not just longer than the legal time, but longer than the required time for the ailments that they have. Um, so we're struggling to meet those health targets and that therefore means we struggle to meet the health outcomes. Uh, so I, I, I'll develop more of this in my closing speech, but all, what I would say is that we need, the, the, in terms of what is happening on the, on the ground, it's all very well having a debate this afternoon and agreeing the definitions, agreeing the indicators, 
you know, clapping everybody on the back and saying how inclusive we are. But if on the ground we don't have a, you know, the, the health service is failing, there are problems in, educa in education, the number of uh, homeless uh, applications for children in temporary accommodation is rocketing, then there are real issues in terms of achieving those outcomes. And to change that, we need an honest debate uh, involving not just the government. Have I got time to take this? You can, but it'll have to be very short, Mr Doris. Yeah, sure. I make important points about how our public services fits into that. And you talk about negatives in relation to that. We're going to actually properly measure national outcomes and always have to look at the positive as well and actually track what we do well rather than just the negatives the whole time. Mr Kelly. I'm all for being positive, Mr Doris, but the, the point... The point, the point I would make is that there are issues that are happening on the ground. You'll see them in your Mary Hill constituency, I'm sure. And if we're really honest about tackling these as a parliament, then we need an honest debate. Uh, it, needs to, it needs to talk about priorities. It needs to talk about how you manage taxation. And if we do that, we can then be serious about making a real attempt at achieving some of these outcomes. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you very much. That was swift. Uh, I call on Andy Whiteman to open for the Green Party. Six minutes, please, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, today's debate focuses on the national outcomes contained within the national performance framework. As Gordon Linthurst, who is paying close attention to the debate as it proceeds, uh, observed, this isn't always a topic that immediately arouses uh, political passions. Uh, but nevertheless, in the committees that, in which I sit, the Local Government and Communities Committee uh, and the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, I think it's fair to say that members actually did find themselves more interested and engaged in this topic when we took evidence uh, from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, from the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, um, than they first thought they might, uh, which was, was, was gratifying. Um, as uh, Bob Doris mentioned in his opening remarks, having a clear idea of where one is going is important for any government and the national planning framework is as useful a framework as any to provide some direction, accountability, as James Kelly talked about, and purpose to everything that government does. Uh, and as has been uh, emphasized, of course, our role in Parliament is to perform some modest scrutiny of the proposed uh, national outcomes as part of a statutory consultation process. Uh, so in the short time I've got available, I want to focus on two areas that have been the subject of, of debate and have been mentioned already today, uh, the economic outcome uh, and the status of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in doing so, I'm aware that the statutory role of Parliament is restricted to being consulted on the outcomes, not the purposes, values or indicators. Uh, nevertheless, as will be clear from my comments in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals, no one part of the overall framework can be considered in isolation from the others. And I commend the Cabinet Secretary for recognising this in the consultation document uh, and also in the um, in, uh, in going beyond uh, the uh, statutory, uh, strict statutory uh, obligations that the Scottish Government has in this regard. In the Economy Committee report, uh, I was a sole dissenting voice on the question of the overall purpose, and I had an interesting exchange with Mr Mackay on the topic when he gave evidence to the Local Government uh, Committee. The purpose, as currently framed, um, is, and I quote, to focus on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increased well-being and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. As members are aware, and as became evident in evidence, inclusive economic growth is a contested term. Never mind that economic growth itself is problematic since it's predicated on a flawed metric of GDP. Making that growth inclusive is as yet not defined. And thus, to have the concept embedded in the highest level of the National Planning Framework is, as the Carnegie UK Trust pointed out, and as Bob Doris highlighted in the Local Government's report, uh, to confuse uh, the means and ends. And this proposal has also been questioned by Oxfam and SCVO. The outcome, economic outcome by contrast, is framed as having a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable uh, economy. Presiding officer, I would rather have a cooperative economy than a competitive economy, but I agree that our economy, however framed, should be sustainable. So why then is this broad outcome, with no means or metrics associated with it, subverted by an overarching purpose which commits to a flawed, contested and ill-defined progress of what constitutes economic progress? And so I hope in the next iteration of the National Planning Framework it will be abundantly clear through the growing body of evidence, most recently exemplified by a report called Measuring What Matters, 
from the IPPR Commission on Economic Performance, uh, that, the that the purpose needs to be changed to one that reflects the very real limitations of any economy based on the current crude metrics of economic growth. Uh, the second I want to reflect on are the Sustainable Development Goals. These are a set of global goals agreed by all members of the UN and binding on Scotland. They comprise 17 goals, 169 targets and 232 indicators. The indicators are really quite specific. For example, goal five is on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls, and it includes a, the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments and local governments. It includes the proportion of total agricultural population with ownership or secure rights over agricultural land by sex. Now, I welcome the incorporation of the Sustainable Development Goals into the National Planning Framework. But just to be very clear, and the Cabinet Secretary has commented on this twice now, just as the National Performance Framework comprises a purpose, values, outcomes and indicators, the Sustainable Development Goals too comprise the goals themselves and targets and indicators. And yet these goals, targets and indicators are only very selectively and broadly incorporated into the NPF. And whilst I understand it would be inappropriate, indeed I agree it would be inappropriate to incorporate them wholesale, I am concerned that this global framework for performance, which is measurable and reportable in a common framework across all UN member states, I'm concerned that it's not being used as the foundation for Scotland's national performance framework. Uh, these concerns are reflected in the report from the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform uh, Committee, which um, Gord Graham Day um, uh, highlighted earlier. So I would ask the government to consider how it could connect the national performance framework more closely with sustainable development goals. Uh, and that the next iteration of the national performance framework should consider doing just that, given that not least because we have an obligation as part of the UK to report on the sustainable development goals. Presiding officer, outcomes no, are important. Please, please conclude right now. Thank you. Oh, 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 no, no, you're not. You've got another minute. I'm away, yes. I've iterated Thank you. Thank whatever I've done answer. too early. Uh, outcomes are important. And I was deep listening to you. That's my problem. Thank you. <laughs> Just go on. Outcomes are important, and the National Performance Framework remains a work in progress. Just as its introduction was welcomed in 2007 and was a novel departure from conventional means of measuring progress through typically inputs, so too it will be important over a decade from its introduction that the next review is more fundamental and assesses whether the current framework really does provide the best way in light of international best practice to measure the performance of the country. Thank you, and I do apologise, Mr Whiteman, but you kept your balance, that's important. Um, I, call on, I call on Willie Rennie to open for the Liberal Democrats. Six minutes, please. Six minutes, remember Six that, minutes. Presiding Officer. Six <clears throat> minutes, Willie Rennie. Thank you, Deputy President Minister. This is, a, this is a good thing. Having the National Performance Framework is a good thing. The fact that we measure beyond strict economic growth is a good thing. The fact that we consider happiness and satisfaction, which is influenced by things like the environment, public services, the performance, infrastructure, equality and the economy, just in a second. The fact that we try to align them with UN sustainable goals is a, a good thing. And it's good that we review what's in and what's out of the National Performance Framework. That's, all of those things are good things. What's not good is that this is not part of the national discourse. Um, if I went down the body gate in Cooper, in my own constituency, and I started talking to people about the National Performance Framework, people wouldn't have the faintest idea what I was talking about. Now, that happens quite often, but <laughs> certainly would certainly be the case in this circumstance. <laughs> But neither do we debate it in this parliament, because I think if you look, look back through the official report, it's had a handful of mentions in the last five years. In fact, the most mentions it's got in the last five years was when we last reviewed the national performance framework. So it's not even part of the discourse in this parliament as well. And I think it should be, because I think the indicators are important. And this should be the subject of big debates. And we should be looking at it strategically rather than just in an isolated way, which is what we tend to do in this parliament. So I would suggest to the minister that perhaps on government time, I'm not saying we should have a debate like this every year, but we should certainly have a debate on the substance of the indicators every single year. And the government should have to come forward and explain itself. Yes, yeah, certainly. Derek Mackay. I, I appreciate that comment and I'll certainly give it thought. The one point I would make, of course, I'm not disputing anything Willie Rennie has said 
uh, so far, though, is that every year on production of my draft budget, I also produce the scorecard on the outcomes and our performance against that. But it's also true to say that members are far more interested in the input measures, back to James Kelly's point, than necessarily the outcomes. So there's a duty upon us all to focus on that debate also. Well, I think the, government, the government could help to force the Parliament to consider it by actually creating time for a debate every year and putting it forward, putting the results forward in a broader sense, rather than perhaps some of the other debates that we have in this chamber that are of perhaps less value. Now, he agreed with me so far, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to bring a bit of uh, disagreement into it because I want to look at some of those targets. Of the 11 purpose targets, eight of the 11 show no improvement or a decline. The decline in the performance on income equality and regional equality is especially concerning. Performance overall, I would say, is stagnating and sluggish at best. Then the national indicators are poor too. Of the 55 indicators, 43 show no improvement or a drop in performance. Educational attainment has fallen, that's particularly concerning. And we are failing on the number of people in poverty. The abundance of breeding birds has declined as well. So in a variety of different areas, we're not performing. That's why I think it's important that we have a debate so we can argue these points, because I'm sure the minister would have a contrary view and an explanation for some of these things, but we never get into the guts of this. And I think we should, and that's why I think we should have a debate on an annual basis so that we can properly scrutinise in a strategic sense. Of course, we debate these individual issues and individual debates, but let's look at it in a strategic sense because I think it's much more valuable that way. Um, I thought it was intriguing, I think the Minister pointed it out, that there is a conclusion that we shouldn't measure everything. You know, some people say that if you don't measure it, it doesn't count, but if you measure everything, does it devalue it? And I suspect it does it devalue it. But therefore, but when everybody agreed that we should be measuring everything, then everybody else comes up with a long list of things that should be in it. It's much more difficult to take things out. Now, my argument perhaps should be that we should be focusing on what we're trying to change within the next five years, rather than trying to have the ultimate comprehensive set of targets and indicators, because that way we can perhaps focus on what the priorities are for change. Because I noticed one of the, the backbench members of the SNP pointed out to James Kelly that he's been far too negative. I think this parliament is about focusing on the things that are going wrong to try and fix them. If we're not here to try and change society, why are we bothering to actually turn up to this parliament in the first place? If we just want to be complacent and dwell on the things we're getting right, I don't think we're going to deliver any change. Yes. Bob Doris. As, as the backbench MSP that M Mr Rainey was referring to, uh, I wasn't accusing anyone of being too negative. You've got to actually measure outcomes. You have to measure all the outcomes, good, bad and indifferent, and not just focus on the negatives. That's how you measure outcomes. I, well, see, I, Rennie. I don't agree, because if you measure everything, we'll not have a real focus on what we're trying to do in this parliament, which is make a better society. If it's just to satisfy the government, we're not going to get any further forward. Now, I know that's difficult for government members and government ministers. That's difficult. But that's what they're there for, to try and change society. Of course, we'll get you know, the First Minister trotting out the greatest list of achievements in the previous week at First Minister's Questions. There's plenty of opportunities to do that, including Patsy Backbencher's questions. That's always there for everybody. <laughs> but let's focus. Let's focus. And I, I know Bob Doris would never do such a thing. But, but what we should really be trying to do in this national performance framework, in an objective way as possible, focus on what we're trying to change to improve. And I think the other, the other important factor, I think, was the, the chief executive of uh, Scottish Enterprise pointed out that how do we know what the effect of policy actually is? Of course, things might have improved, but actually, is it because of government action or was it going to happen anyway? Finding a way to measure that I think would be valuable. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Now move to the open debate. Speeches of up to five minutes, please, because we're a bit pushed for time. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by John McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, can I thank the Local Government and Communities Committee for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and I welcome the opportunity to contribute. So, in considering national outcomes as a tool to set a tone uh, for the direction of travel uh, the government wished to go, uh, I, I think it would be uh, obvious that, that would, we would all support that, that wholeheartedly. Uh, and for me, in, in business parlance, it kind of equates to a, a, a business mission statement, if you will, 
In sporting parlance, where I'm now going back to my, uh, my roots, it's having that long-term aspiration, such as a young sports person wanting to be an Olympic champion or wanting to lift the Football World Cup for Scotland. I'm trying to take the chamber with me in this one. Now, we may not uh, end up at the final goal uh, that, that, that we set, but if we've managed the process well, we'll be able to uh, uh, understand how close we came to that goal. And, and, not necessarily, and not hitting that goal, perhaps, doesn't necessarily equate to a failure. Again, I'm taking my own uh, experiences here. Uh, now, I'm a, a great believer in aspiration of setting down the highest of goals so we can, we can read them and, and we can refer to them. We can constantly remind ourselves uh, of where we are heading ensuring that whatever we do is delivering on these objectives. I'm also a great believer in committing to those goals and those aspirations and to do so requires short and medium term and deliver objectives that we're able to measure, that are time sensitive, that have enough flex to be able to adapt as goals are met or otherwise. The road will not be straight and without its bumps, so having that ability to adapt as things change is key. Uh, the best strategies are consistent, uh, but have that flexibility to adapt. So I'm glad that the, the government, and welcome the fact that the government have written down their uh, higher level objectives. The strategy in delivering against these objectives is not a strategy unless it's written down. And far be it from me to quote somebody like Alistair Campbell, but uh, I, I do agree with him in saying when he said that developing a strategy is about having arguments, uh, not avoiding them. Uh, I would go further, especially uh, having partaken in many arguments in this chamber and say those arguments should at least attempt to be constructive and that the government therefore uh, it should be, uh, open itself up for scrutiny and I think that's really what where the, the debate here is. I would go on to say that a good strategy is about action and not theory. This is where effective tactics must come into play. In other words, what are the step-by-step -step initiatives that will ultimately deliver on those national outcomes. And I think you know, the Cabinet Secretary talked about having a debate around process or not having a debate around process, but I think actually this is where, uh, where we should be able to scrutinise uh, that particular process, because without that, uh, national objectives won't be reached. So I think this is where we are, uh, and as the government are coming a little bit late, I think there's, there's, there's a, I think, an unwillingness to open up ideas to scrutiny. And I do think that uh, sometimes the government do try and close down debate, and to me, this inevitably leads to a much weaker proposition uh, and an outcome. I think they take high-level objectives uh, that we all agree with and, and absolutely support, as I've already said, but I think that we need to look at how we deliver on the nuts and bolts required to deliver on these objectives. Deputy Presiding Officer, governments and politicians are always being accused of avoiding issues, making high-level promises and commitments, using vague language without backing these up with a sort of business-like strategy. And I think my, my concern here is that the government may be uh, have, may, may, may falling into the same kind of pattern. It's not in... I'd love to take an intervention. Right? Derek Mackay. I, I just... Um, if Mr Whittle thinks I've got something wrong, can he identify in the proposed national performance framework just one outcome that he would like me to change to suit his contribution so far? Brian Whittle. If you listen to what I said, your outcomes are not the issue. It's how you're going to deliver on those outcomes. That, that, that process of how to deliver on those outcomes is what I'm questioning here. Um, so I, I see it's not enough to, do, to, to set an objective uh, or a national outcome, uh, uh, to deliver sound bites and use language in a way that the public want to hear. It, it's in, in setting national outcomes, I think the government must uh, be able to understand that objective. It must understand the steps that will need to be taken and in what time frame. And it must be prepared to make sacrifices needed to reach their goal. Now, one could suggest in certain circumstances that, uh, that the SNP are particularly good at working towards a certain goal, irrespective of all the sacrifices and goals that it, uh, goal that it entails to, uh, to, to the rest of the country. However, my feeling reading the report is that, that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a potential here for abandoning hard targets in favour of vagaries and, 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 and that are difficult to quantify, difficult to measure against, and, and therefore really the government can't fail uh, and for example uh, I will look at the national outcomes uh, in education and, and I was reading here it says you know we, we, we are better educated we're more skilled and more successful absolutely agree with that can't disagree with that we're renowned for research and innovation which I think we already are and would like that to continue and our young people are successful learners confident individuals effective contributors and responsible citizens etc etc but Yet we've seen in recent weeks in a Conservative debate that, uh, and FMQs, the government's reluctance to have an educational record 
scrutinised against their own targets. I see I'm, I'm coming to the end of that. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, Deputy Spending Officer, I say the local government committee's report uh, highlights for me a lack of clarity in goals and objectives and measurables and strategies and tactics in delivering against objectives. Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I remind everyone it's up to five minutes, please? And that's John McAlpine to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Presiding officer, I'm delighted to speak today on the Local Government and Community Committee's report on the National Performance Framework. And I think it's important to remind ourselves, as the Carnegie UK Trust say in their briefing, uh, that the Scottish Government broke new ground globally when it introduced a holistic definition of social progress back in 2007. And I think that's something that we should all celebrate as a parliament. I'm convener of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee, but I'm speaking in a personal capacity today. And this is because, as Mr Doris indicated, my committee lacked time to scrutinise the draft outcomes as we would have wished, uh, although we have responded to the committee's request for our views. I welcome the proposed new draft outcome for culture. It reads, we are creative and our vibrant and diverse cultures are expressed and enjoyed widely. And attached to this are several indicators. Uh, these are attendance at cultural events, participation in cultural activity, growth in the cultural economy, and people working in arts and culture. Uh, all my colleagues on the committee welcomed the new outcome in a letter which appears in the report we're debating today. This specific outcome in culture will also be welcomed by stakeholders who have long campaigned for one, although none of them contributed to the local government and communities committee call for evidence. Uh, I assume they just didn't have time, but I do acknowledge that it did contribute to the extensive pre-parliamentary scrutiny, and I welcome that. Uh, these organisations include culture counts based within the Federation of Scottish Theatre, which represents 40 different arts organisations, and it's led the campaign for an improved place for culture in Scotland's national outcomes. And in 2011, uh, this campaigning resulted in the inclusion of an indicator on cultural engagement. Uh, this was very welcome because there's an increased understanding right across the world that cultural engagement is val valuable, not just in and of itself, because it has a beneficial impact across other policy areas, such as in health and well-being, learning, equality, and contributing to sustainable economic growth through our vibrant creative industries and the work of many thousands of individual artists as well. As a convener of the party's cross, this is the Parliament's cross-party group on culture, I chaired a meeting in 2015 devoted to this issue in which culture counts pointed out that culture is the glue that holds society together. It can address inequality and it can empower communities. And it was pointed out that Sweden in particular have for some time recognised that cultural participation and enjoyment impacts on a broad range of policy areas. And that, that's also um, uh, apparent in their budget streams as well. Of course, we do see this in practice in Scotland too. And I think it's certainly something that the Cabinet Secretary responsible for culture, Fiona Hislop, understands very well. And if I can quote just one example, some members here will have been able to enjoy the event last night, celebrating the 10th birthday of Systema Scotland, big noise orchestras, which transform the lives of children living in parts of Scotland that face many social and economic challenges. Now, the funding for that amazing project didn't just come from the culture budget stream, it was considered an infrastructure investment because the orchestras would help to build the resilience of communities. That's just one example, uh, though, and I would like to know what other examples there are of this, and will the new outcome on creativity result in more culture expen cultural spending across all budget strands? Uh, there's something that makes me slightly nervous in that we are told that the UN Sustainable Development Goals underpin the National Performance Framework. In the government's document on the framework, underneath the creativity outcome, there are three linked UN Sustainable Development Goals. These are improving gender equality, reducing inequality, and building sustainable cities and communities. Now, I agree with all that, but I wonder why culture is not aligned to a wider range of sustainable development goals, for example, Yes, I will. You have to be very quick, please. It is simply to make the point that the document can only express so much. What will appear online will absolutely show that interconnectivity right across the outcomes and the indicators and the UN Sustainable Goals in a more comprehensive fashion. 
Half a minute left, Ms McAlpine. Thank you very much. Well, I was actually going to ask the Cabinet Secretary for reassurance on that point, so I'm very, I'm very pleased for his reassurance and uh, because I think that will benefit the whole of society and not just um, the culture strand in itself. Thanks very much. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you, presiding officer. Over the 37 years of my working life in the public, private and voluntary sector, I've witnessed and participated in numerous new approaches, fresh ideas and rethinks on how frameworks should look, feel and be worded. But one thing fundamentally doesn't change. Frameworks are there to say what you're going to do, how you intend to do it and how you will know if you've done it. So this is the debate we're having today. Is this going to deliver that? I actually do welcome the extensive conversations that the Cabinet Secretary has, has had, um, not personally, I believe, but with his, with his staff. Um, and I also welcome his willingness to be flexible around the consultation. Um, we're hearing today that there's obviously quite a lot of debate around some of the points. But for me, the challenge lies in ensuring that the indicators are understood and that the relationships between the indicators are coherent. And in answer to the question that's just been asked, the Cabinet Secretary might stand up and say, he's done what I'm about to ask, but we'll see. So, for example, a coherent and well-considered approach to tackling poverty is required. And these indicators, as they stand what I've seen, will not tell the full story. It appears the indicators at present fail to appreciate that, say, the more employees that there are on the living wage, the more this will impact on the cost of living and potentially even food poverty. We must tackle poverty, not simply by sharing wealth, but by generating it, improving economic growth and productivity. But more than this, there must be a focus on the drivers of poverty beyond income. So the national outcome, as I've seen it, failed... Yes? Claudia Beamish. As long as it's very brief. I thank the member for taking a brief intervention. Does the member agree with me, then, that um, being a living wage employer, for instance, is one of the things that would come through in policy, um, where, which the indicators underpin, and how important that is? Michelle Ballantyne. Well, I return to my point that actually living wage employers, which I hope eventually everybody will absolutely will be, but it potentially drives up the cost of whatever product they deliver. So we have to see the interconnectivity between the outcomes, the drivers that we asked for, and the implications of what they mean on the, on the workplace or on the marketplace. Um, so the National Outcome fails to take into account the root causes of poverty, such as the attainment gap, parental addiction, broken families and worklessness. On that note, it struck me that there appears to be a salient omission in, in the indicators, and that is the provision of not just fair work, but flexible work. If there is to be opportunities for everyone, then there needs to be the availability of flexible work to allow single parents or carers, for example, to participate and use their skills. Then we have growing up, loved, safe and respected. And I'm slightly concerned that this is one of the weakest outcomes because we know that growing up loved will instill confidence and resilience in our children. However, there must be a means of measuring the extent to which this is actually achieved. Otherwise, we don't know whether we've done it. A good start in life can benefit people in so many ways. And therefore, this outcome is perhaps to me one of the most important. So I've got a request amongst the many you're going to get. I'm disappointed that there is no indicator regarding breastfeeding, because this would be an easily measured, appropriate indicator for... Qu you, yeah. Derek Mackay. I think the answer I would give, and I appreciate taking the intervention, I think the answer I would give is that what I gave at local government committee, and it's important to stress this point, there are many uh, measurements that will still undertake, particularly NHS and health and social measurements that may not feature in the national performance framework for the reason that Gordon Linhurst said and, and Willie Rennie said that you can't count everything, we continue to measure it and it will still be a health target but for the purposes of the MPF it won't feature but I agree it's a priority, we want to deliver on it, it will still be measured and it will still be reported upon. Michelle Ballantyne. That's good news. Can I make an argument for why I think it should be higher up the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and actually it's fundamentally because there is no breastfeeding culture in this country and it is undermined by the promotion of formula milks which are not an adequate, adequate substitute and breastfeeding network constantly point this out um, and it is worrying because after six to eight weeks only around 30% of children are breastfeed, breastfed sorry. Um, and this sometimes means because mothers are coming out of hospital early now and that's a good thing 
that they're discharged before breastfeeding is properly established and there are not enough resources to properly support mothers in the community and therefore supplementation rates are high. But we know that breastfeeding contributes to healthy weight, healthy cognitive development and it can also be important for, for forming positive relationships between mother and baby which can be vital in determining children's mental health and attainments outcomes in the future. So you've got a very simple thing here that can have a massive difference right across your framework. And that's why I think it should be much higher up in actually what we're saying we want to do, what our outcomes will be, and it's very measurable, so you'll know if you've succeeded. Um, there hasn't been much improvement in the number of mothers breastfeeding in Scotland. And similarly, there's been little improvement to support and encourage more mothers to breastfeed. So, yes, it's always been a health target, but it's not getting the attention it needs, I don't think. That's why I want it up there. Can you close so, now, please, Ms. Palantir? Yeah. So, um, fundamentally, I need to know if policies are working. I agree with what Mr. Rennie said, and that would be my challenge to you. I like the way it looks. That's my upside to it. I think you've done a really good job in the presentation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan McKee to be followed by Claudia Bibish. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Much of this debate has been around what should be or shouldn't be included in the National Performance Framework Outcomes, and that's important. But I want, during my brief contribution, to explore the process whereby we can deliver those outcomes in the relationship between outcomes, indicators and targets. Because only by understanding those relationships and how they support process improvement can we effectively direct resources towards the outcomes ensuring that there's something we're making progress towards and not just aspirations with no roadmap for delivery. Without getting this right, the process of public service delivery runs the risk of, of drift, lack of focus and succumbing to the simplicity of sound bites over substance. Delivering high quality public services as efficiently as possible is what is at stake. Making a difference to people's lives and doing so in a financially sustainable way is the prize. Well, the Scottish Government's use of the performance framework is recognised as being world leading compared to other governments in terms of global best practice across all sectors, there is more to be done. The issue of embedding the NPF in public bodies is something that is recognised in the Local Government Committee's report. Like all good continuous improvement activities, embedding is not an event but an ongoing process. The more that public bodies build the framework outcomes and indicators into their own work, the more effective it will be and the more joined up government will be. Of course, not every activity, every objective or every operational target is included in the NPF and nor should they be. But the relationship between those day-to-day -day operational measures and objectives and the higher level, more strategic national performance outcomes has to be clearly understood and mapped out. The hierarchy of key performance indicators cascading down from the national performance framework to local indicators and targets need to be clear. If local service delivery is focused on a set of measures and objectives that exist in an island with no bridge to the NPF, then we will struggle to succeed at all levels. The test of a truly well-functioning performance framework is not just what it contains, but how relevant it is seen to be by those delivering on the ground. In any system where there is such a disconnect, there is inefficiency, but also scope for improvement. The work of Harry Burns' review into targets and indicators in the health context also contributes to this discussion. It presents in a coherent fashion the way outputs, indicators and targets are related as uh, all are, as part of a continuous improvement process under a whole systems approach. However, in the health context, and I expect across other public services, it also highlights the existence of multiple suites of performance indicators, not all necessarily linked to each other or to the NPF indicators. And when it comes to the relationship between spend and outcomes, more work has to be done. The budget review process is putting more emphasis on understanding these links. And while it's not always possible to directly map spend onto a specific outcome, much spend is, for example, process infrastructure that contributes to multiple outcomes. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do so where possible. And indeed, constantly assessing the relationship between inputs, outputs and outcomes is essential to focusing resources most effectively. The Christie Commission stresses the importance of moving beyond a focus on inputs towards assessing the impact of our actions on outcomes. And this has been mentioned previously in the debate. This is something that does not come naturally, however, to politicians. The lure of headline-grabbing extra resource commitments is difficult to ignore. 
viewing the answer to all service delivery problems as a need for more spend, rather than assessing the equally important relationship between spend and results, is a trap we all too easily fall into. Yet we have to have the mature debate on effective service delivery. We do need to move beyond discussing just inputs. Finally, presiding officer, a word on measurement. The great Scottish scientist and engineer, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, is credited with saying, when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But you, when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. And while this may not be true in all cases, the default position certainly should be that we should seek to measure where possible to ensure we know where we are, which is of course a key part of making sure we keep moving forward towards our destination. In conclusion, presiding officer, the National Performance Framework is a powerful vehicle for driving public service improvement. I hope to see more work by the government to ensure the framework is further embedded and deployed to deliver high quality and cost effective services across the public sector. Thank you. Claudia Beamish, followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The National Performance Framework is fundamental to ensuring that our policies are embedded in our collective vision and principles for Scotland. This goes beyond the elect electoral cycles. As a member of the NPF Roundtable representing Scottish Labour since the time when John Swinney was chairing it, I've followed progress closely. I want to draw focus on one of the criteria of the new national outcomes to better reflect the values and aspirations of the public, experts, stakeholders and ministers. In my view, the consultation arrangements and feedback uh, achieved the public part pretty well, not by asking people down the pub what they thought of the MPF, uh, to follow on from what Willie Rennie was saying, but actually uh, because phase one of the review involved consulting with the public on what kind of Scotland they would like to live in and was supported by the Carnegie Trust and had street stalls undertaken by Oxfam as well. And uh, let's also be aware that um, uh, there were 550, 15 participants involved across a range of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation Areas and covering eight electoral regions. Marginalised communities were, in my view, thus actively involved. And the round table itself activated stakeholders. I found one of the particularly interesting contributors was the Children's Parliament, which was again involved in phase one. Whenever the Children's Parliament talks to children about their needs and their rights, we find our conversations revolving around love. If there is a bottom line, a key message, this is that children need to be loved. And I think whatever um, uh, Alexander Stewart says, that most people know what that means. It is a bond, as the Children's Parliament says, and I quote, that they have the protection they need and the basis of confidence, agency and resilience they need to grow and flourish and manage adverse childhood experiences. And childhood well-being is one of the most important of um, the developments in the MPF. So it was challenging, in my view, for the committees to receive the review findings once they had been laid. However, I can't see how else this could have been done, perhaps apart from asking for committee's inputs at phase one as well, which might be considered for the next review. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution stated that he was open to improvement and, and has said that uh, it, if it is about further collaboration and engagement and scrutiny, the MPF could well be enhanced by that. So here we go with a few short points. The Local Government Committee stresses that there is room for improvement in terms of monitoring, both ultimately uh, vital in tracking our progress and ensuring that the MPF is more than just aspirational words. Data should, be, uh, should remain comparable from year to year and accessible online. I appreciate the challenges with this, but I do think that is, is really significant. And I would also add my support to the call for more information uh, from the Cabinet Secretary, how the MPF can be um, applied and monitored through um, in the public sector for a consistent approach uh, towards the same ends. A further review uh, uh, criteria is, and I quote, to improve the alignment of the SDGs and Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. And I welcome the briefing from the Scottish Human Rights Commission and their recognition uh, that the wording does indeed reflect Scotland's human rights obligations and duties under international law. This is the right approach. And I also do believe that we've made a good start, even if we're not really completely there with the SDGs. And to focus on one of these, 
um, highlighted by the Cabinet Secretary himself, to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls is fundamental. In the context of the SDGs, my own Eclair, Eclair Committee notes the view uh, of the Scottish Government on sustainability and sustainable economic growth. And we would welcome further clarification as to whether sustainable development was considered instead of sustainable economic growth. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary might um, respond to that in his closing remarks. A further review criteria, which in my view is the most important of all, was to allow us to better track progress in reducing inequalities, promote equality, and encourage preventative actions. And the Trussell Trust has recently stated that the food banks are now the fourth emergency service and uh, that they gave almost half a million emergency food supplies to children last year across the UK. So in Scotland, there is a real cause for concern and the cuts to councils and other issues are things that must be addressed within the context of the MPF. More broadly and finally, what is prosperity for all? Do we really go beyond GDP in the MPF and measure what matters to the people of Scotland? I know this is a challenge, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Surely the time has come for a pilot to be reported uh, on those measures which are parallel to GDP. And then, in my view, the MPF would be even more fit for purpose and inclusive than it is in this review. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I remain an Aberdeen City Councillor? I'm happy to speak today on the, the revised national outcomes in the National Performance Framework. And the whole process reminds me of my MBA, of teaching MBA, trying to teach them how to do strategic documents. So far, the Scottish Government has informed its decision in amending these outcomes by seeking views from many sources, from adults and experts, to children and even government ministers. I do welcome this approach and would like to see it continue with, into the future. Turning to the revised outcomes, I fear they have become rather vague. In fact, motherhood and apple pie comes to mind. It seems like the government are abandoning hard and measurable targets in favour of vague promises which seemingly cannot fail. This brings me to the topic of management. Spice have said that they do, they do not know how well the national indicators will measure these revised outcomes. When measurement can no longer be directly tied to the outcomes, accountability is lost. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. But we've seen this behavior before. As, as the results were going from bad to worse, the Scottish government scrapped the Scottish survey of liter liter literacy and numeracy. And, and literacy and numeracy levels have plummeted under the S SNP's tenure. I fear that the National Performance Framework no longer de deals with performance. Now, the government will claim that the outcomes are well, still tracked through the national indicators, but my point is they're no longer explicitly measured against them. For every one statistic that exposes a failure or area to be improved, the government still just point to five other vague measurements and pretend that nothing needs to be done. But if we're going to discuss these indicators, let's do it properly. According to the Scottish Scotland Perform, Performance website, over four-fifths of the 55 national indicators are not improving. Yes, please do. Derek Mackay. Does the member not see the blatant inconsistency in the remarks he's just made to say that we don't judge performance and then turns to the very measurement in which we judge performance and we publish even those areas that show we haven't met the kind of performance that we want. So my commitment is that Scotland performs will continue, it will continue to measure, and it will continue to report, and that's available not just to Parliament, but all of public. So you cannot say there is no scrutiny and then turn to the scrutiny to then criticise the government's performance. Tom Mason. The scrutiny is, judging, is just that. It's judging the, go the government's performance against the indicators. And since, since the indicators so far indicate that four-fifths have not, not improved uh, at all. On top of this, the government are missing their current economic performance targets, costing short of billions of pounds. The SNP should have, have you believe that this is not their fault, that somehow the UK government or even Brexit is to blame. However, in the Finance Constitution Committee session yesterday, Andrew Chapman from the government's own Fiscal Responsibility Division said that the current problem we face 
are a Scotland-specific economic shock, a worrying indictment of the government's performance. In the face of this information, you would expect a robust response, perhaps a decluttering of the economic landscape or lowering taxes on businesses and people to encourage them to interact, because consumer spending is by far the largest part of our economy. And what do we get instead? An increasingly vague set of national outcomes and a 400-page fantasy novel on independence. At least we know where the SNP priorities lie. In looking at these revised outcomes, I couldn't help but notice that the previous commitment to high-quality public services did not make the latest cut. Obviously, obviously the government feels that the outcome has been achieved. Yes, if you wish. I have to be very quick. Does, very, okay. does the member not recognise that high-quality public services is a means to an end, not an end in itself? We have about 30 seconds. Mr. That's Mr. too Mason. complicated for me to understand that. However, last year the public satisfaction with local guest services fell by 10%. At the time, I asked Derek Mackay, the Minister, whether he thought the best way to respond to this was the government's plan to force councils to raise local taxes. Instead of stating the obvious answer, no, he claimed that the public services were local authorities' responsibility, not the government's. Indeed, he said that the devolved administrations were, I quote, autonomous bodies responsible for managing their own day-to-day -day business with money available to them. A sentiment I would like to see him apply to his own organ organisation. You come to a close, Point please, is, Mr Mason. I worry, presiding officer, I worry that the simple accountability is being hushed out of the door in favour of normative statements which are easy to spin. I worry that the SNP won't measure it, and so they can't manage it. And I think that is the worst outcome of all. Thank you. We move to the closing speeches, and I call on James Kelly. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I, th I think in, in, in some senses it's been a, uh, an interesting debate. Uh, there have been a number of themes to it. Uh, what interested me in the, the initial stages was the contributions from the people speaking on behalf of the committees, and there seemed to be some differences of opinion. Um, you know, I thought Graham Day made a very good case for some of the indicators that he didn't feel were included, like land ownership, uh, for example. Um, and we heard from Gordon Lindhurst on behalf of the Economy Committee, and a theme in that, the evidence to that committee was that perhaps there were too many indicators and they should get cut down. Uh, I thought Andy Whiteman made a good case for including you know, a, a measure around the cooperative economy. Um, however, I do take the, the Cabinet Secretary's point that you, you've got to be careful that you don't sort of drown in, in definitions and that we need some uh, element of clarity around this. I think one way forward on that is, was pointed out by Claudia Beamish uh, when she said that a local government committee were looking for proper monitoring to take place and I think you know, that, that would help greatly in terms of what are the what are the correct and most effective definitions? I think Willie Rennie, Willie Rennie's contribution was excellent and you know, really kind of brought straight to the heart about what this debate is about. Um, there is a danger that we can uh, spend all afternoon or too much of the, the process debating what indicators and uh, what measures should be included and we lose sight of what we are uh, in, in actual fact trying to achieve. I agree with the point you made that there are too many debates, uh, there, are, or there are debates in this parliament that we don't necessarily need to allocate uh, so much time to, and we should find more time to develop the themes that were coming out of this debate, uh, not just in terms of the outcomes, but in, in the scrutiny around the outcomes. Um, because, you know, the reality is, that, and the, the measures show this, that the government uh, is struggling in some areas. You know, in, in one ward in Rutherglen, Rutherglen Central and North, child poverty is running at 28%. And that means that in that ward, you know, there'll be children who are not being fed and clothed properly, um, that, you know, might be going out to school in winter mornings with holes in their shoes. And that's a real issue. That undermines the, the ability for those kids to be safe and those kids to be educated properly. 
Um, you know, we've, we've frequently heard in this chamber in recent times about the challenges in education, you know, three and a half thousand less teachers, uh, not enough teachers in technology and engineering, and that undermines uh, our ability in terms of economic performance. So I think we need to, to be aware of those issues, I think, and that needs to be brought into the debate. And that can be difficult uh, in a political climate where, understandably, the government don't want to admit that they're, that they're wrong. Uh, and it can be quite heated, particularly around the time of the budget process. I think to an extent, Ivan McKee outlined a way forward on that and that, you know, we need a process that, you know, only looks at inputs, you know, money allocated to the budget, but uh, also looks at out output and outcomes. And I, I don't think it's just the monitoring around that, you know, we do need to change uh, the overall nature of the debate. I think, again, as Willie Rennie suggested, you know, I think we need uh, more debates and more honest debates about this in the Parliament. When we debate these around the budget time, um, the debates been, can be quite charged. Uh, and also, it's, it's, uh, I understand it's difficult that the government want to always bring forward uh, a positive pers prospectus. But if we're ever going to achieve um, proper progress in these areas, there needs to be an element of honesty about it. And that not only involves the, the government, but also involves um, the opposition parties. Yeah, sure. Derek Mackay. Just again, in the spirit of, of transparency and openness, to remind the Chamber that at every budget, I also produce, as I said to Willie Rennie, the scorecard, the Scotland Performance Scorecard, which sets out even challenging statistics on progress in relation to the National Performance Framework. But we all have a duty to promote and scrutinise that, which has been published for years, but maybe this debate will add to that interest in future years. James Kelly. I think that's very true. I think the other, th the other thing that's linked to this is um, there needs to be an honest debate about um, you know, priorities in the budget you know, and how, how you find the money for that. Um, I mean, obviously, the most recent budget round, uh, you know, Labour put forward uh, an extensive list of uh, spending commitments. And there's the debate to be had about, you know, whether those are right, you know, uh, whether the, the level of taxation is correct. But, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I, I think there needs, for all parties, there needs to be an honesty about the, whatever budget you come to, um, it's a defined number, you know, and that, therefore, there, there will always be challenges within that budget in terms of what you're able to achieve. Um, but I think the problem with the debates around the budget period is that we all uh, get into kind of locked party positions and sometimes we're not able to have a proper exchange around the issues and challenges. And that, therefore, undermines our ability to uh, achieve the, the national incomes. And summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, Gordon Lindgast, Lint has said this was a debate for anoraks. I think we need to get our anoraks off and get down to dealing with the issues if we're going to deliver on national outcomes. I call Graeme Simpson. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you just called me an anorak there. Um, but uh, <laughs> in any case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> Um, I, I, I have to say, um, I, my, my heart uh, soared somewhat when I saw our own uh, list of speakers and uh, uh, I saw that Alexander Stewart was uh, going first um, because uh, this whole subject, um, I've got to be honest, left me a little bit cold. Uh, and uh, during the uh, local government committee uh, session with the cabinet secretary, I, I think I achieved a first uh, in that I asked no, no questions, none whatsoever. Um, I didn't rib Mr. Mackay. Um, I, I asked him nothing. Um, it's not just because I like Mr. Mackay, which I do, uh, but I genuinely uh, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't, uh, couldn't really think of anything because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get my head round the, the waffle uh, that is the, uh, the national outcomes. Um, and I, it sort of took me back to my uh, previous, uh, previous uh, employment as a, a sub-editor on a newspaper, and if I'd seen... Uh, these uh, outcomes coming before me, I would have been asking uh, what, what they meant. 
Uh, let me just run, I'm going to run through them all because we haven't had this uh, comprehensive list in this debate. Um, we have a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable economy. We're open, connected and make a positive contribution internationally. We tackle poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally. We live in communities that are inclusive, empowered, resilient and safe. We grow up loved, safe and respected so that we can realize our full potential. We're well educated, skilled and able to contribute to society. We have thriving and innovative businesses with quality jobs and fair work for everyone. We are healthy and active. I'm not sure that we are healthy and active. I am, but I'm not sure everyone else is. <laughs> um, we value, enjoy, protect uh, and enhance our environment. We are creative and our, our vibrant, diverse cultures are enjoyed widely. We respect, protect and fulfill human rights and live free from discrimination. And the final one, which I think was there before, our public services are high quality, continually improving, efficient and responsive to local people's needs. Now, yes? Graham Day. If I take that intervention. You know, he talks about this being waffle, but would he not accept that the response of the stakeholders to the environment committees call for evidence? And indeed, the depth in which the environment committee has gone into this and the number of recommendations and calls on the government's made suggest this actually really matters? Graham Simpson. Well, I can only say what I think. Um, you know, and that's, and that's, my, that's my view of the language used. Um, now, the Child Poverty Action Group uh, welcomed the inclusion of poverty within the national outcomes, but questioned whether tackling poverty is an outcome. Instead, they suggest it's a process intended to achieve the goal of eradicating poverty for good. They said that in the interest of clarity, that's very important, the outcome should state the eventual aim rather than the method of achieving it. Uh, and I think they're right, and that's the problem. The wording is all wrong. It's bureaucratic babble, it's government speak gone mad. Now, Alexander Stewart and others were quite right to point this out when they spoke of ambiguous wording and vague promises. Now, I was wondering um, who could be responsible? Was it the cabinet secretary? Well, apparently not, um, because when Derek Mackay appeared before the local government committee, um, he gave the game away. Um, there had been a cross-party group formed. He said, this is the first time we've tried to define our mission and our purpose beyond just what the government wants to achieve. We've tried to define our purpose as a society as well, which takes us into our val values. Frankly, his words, if I can get agreement around the table between people such as Murdo Fraser and Patrick Harvey, I suggest I'm not doing too badly. So there we have it, Deputy Presiding Officer. Murdo Fraser is the villain here. In, co in, in collusion with the Cabinet Secretary and Patrick Harvey. Claudia Beamish, uh, who, who has left, sadly, uh, was spared. Uh, so, <laughs> I know she was, but you didn't mention her. Uh, so, Presiding Officer, um, I think it's been, uh, it's been an interesting debate uh, for me because I have learned some stuff that I didn't know before. Um, I'll tell you something that you didn't know. Um, Michelle Ballantyne, who spoke about uh, breastfeeding, uh, uh, speaks, uh, is a bit of an authority. She has uh, had six, six children who were all breastfed, which uh, probably makes her the breastfeeding champion of the parliament. So she does know what she's talking about. Gordon Lindhurst, in a rather bizarre opening, I thought, quoted from, uh, <laughs> quoted from Twelfth Night, uh, but at least uh, he went on to describe his committee as anorak wearers. I don't know what the rest of them will make of that. Uh, just to prove his point, though, he went on to quote from a French philosopher. However, I think Mr. Lindhurst was agreeing that things have to be clearer, something like that anyway, presiding officer. Um, we, b despite what I've said, uh, welcome uh, the draft national outcomes. They are important. Uh, that's been impressed on me by various speakers, uh, and so I uh, commend the document despite its vagueness. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> I call on Derek Mackay. Up to seven minutes, please. Do you know, presiding officer, I think maybe the last comment of Graham Simpson maybe just makes that point that despite some of the criticism in the debate this afternoon, it is to be commended. Now, we have made a number of points, some party political, some genuinely about process, but fundamentally, is there a deep-seated challenge to the purpose or the values or the outcomes that government and parliament ultimately is proposing? I genuinely don't believe that there is real divergence between us. The reason that's important, that there is consensus, is it will calibrate the public sector, the private sector and the third sector and wider community to help deliver those kind of outcomes. And I would be very careful in describing some of it as waffle because it was developed in consultation with the communities of Scotland. Some of the language has come from children and the children's parliament in relation to them. Some of it's come from human rights organisations, environmental organisations and the business community. So I would just say this is not political correctness gone mad, as you often hear. This is an evidence-based approach as to how we align our efforts to build a better society and one which can define, as best we possibly can, the kind of society that we seek. And in that regard, yes, I have tried to balance the political interest from the Conservative represent representative, Murdo Fraser, through to the Greens positioning and Patrick Harvey. All political parties were invited to the round table that helped shape uh, the process and uh, contributed very constructively. Of course I will. Michelle Ballantyne. I hear what you're saying and I won't, won't argue with that, but one of the things I, I would ask in the process is that if we, if we accept what you're saying is correct, and I'm happy to do that, but would you also accept that in order for it be, to be meaningful to Parliament, which is, is where it comes down to in terms of that measurement, that we do have to have a way of measuring and understanding whether what you've set out is achieved and, and in what context. So when, when you come back here to late before us, will, will you make sure that we do have some actual things that we can get hold of and say, there's the baseline, there's where we're going? Yes. Can, can I remind I, all members that even when you're being nice to each other, you should <laughs> speak through the chair? <laughs> <laughs> Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, yes is the answer uh, to the question. Because the Scotland's Performs website is better than just an occasional report sent to some committees. It is live. It is transparent and the measurements through the indicators have been determined largely by the chief statistician and the Scottish Government. So officials have worked very hard to address what we think we can measure. But so too have others, STUC and other organisations, asked me to put in indicators that we hadn't proposed. And I changed those indicators. A few very important points in relation to the criticism and consultation. What I've done is what the law has asked me to do. And I have gone beyond that. I didn't just publish the proposed purpose and outcomes, I also published the indicators. The law does not require me to do that. It was my imperative, it was at my instruction the indicators were published because of course it makes sense to set out how you propose to measure that which you're trying to uh, deliver. And all of this indeed was shared with the cross-party steering group on which there was business representation, charities, uh, children and a whole host uh, of other people um, as well. So the indicators are, I think, credible, uh, I think they are helpful, and at times they will be critical where progress is not made. And I say again, there are many things that will not be published in the National Performance Framework for the reasons that other members have given, but will be published elsewhere, and absolutely the government will be held to account uh, for. Whether that's in parliamentary debate, whether that's in committee, whether that's in questions, and I get many parliamentary, uh, yes I will, Graham Day. Thank you. On, on that point of, of scrutiny, I wonder how the Cabinet Secretary views Wally Rennie's uh, suggestion about more regular consideration uh, in the Chamber of, of MPF and whether he might share my view that such an approach might best be undertaken in the form of joint committee debates on the back of individual committee work rather than in government time where I think as James Kelly alluded to we would see members contributing as individuals and we would certainly see party politics creeping into that. I just wonder if having scrutiny based upon um, broader and detailed committee work ahead of that might um, get us a better uh, outcome. Derek Mackay. Yes, I do agree with that. I think it's a helpful suggestion because 
Just as we are proposing all year round budget scrutiny, of course we should have all year round scrutiny of Scotland performs and the performance, not just of government, but right across society uh, as well. And that's why the alignment is so important. I think some members have got confused between purpose uh, and values, outcomes and indicators, and then going even beyond the indicators, what's crucially important uh, is implementation and the policy actions that deliver success, hopefully, in that regard. By all means, criticise implementation, but that was not what today's debate was about. That is not what the current consultation process is about. It's trying to establish, if we can, as a parliament, uh, unite around the outcomes and the purpose. As I say, I've offered the indicators for further uh, scrutiny, but I welcome all the transparency uh, and contributions to this debate, which I will, of course, reflect upon. I think I've tried to make on a number of occasions the point around um, sustainable development goals as understood by the United Nations as part of this structure. But a key point I'd make is that the interrelationship between the outcomes and that, those measurements, those indicators are complex. And I think the website will helpfully show how a range of indicators relate to a range of outcomes. But fundamentally, this is about the consensus on our vision for our country and our purpose. And I have tried to balance those who want economic growth with those who don't want economic growth, those who want inclusivity, with those who don't think inclusivity is as important as we believe that it is. But the purpose itself captures all of that, focuses on, yes, sustainable economic growth, well-being, equality for all, so that our country and all of our people have an opportunity to flourish. Now, I'm particularly pleased that I've worked so closely with other political parties, with human rights charities, with community groups, with the Children's Parliament, with STUC, with COSLA, with the business community, and yes, with Murdo Fraser, Patrick Harvey, Claudia Beamish, the Liberal Democrats were invited as well. And I do think we can disagree over implementation if we choose and performance, but where surely we can agree is that we want to build a fairer society and a stronger nation. And we need this. As Brian Whittle said, this is a mission statement and there is much agreement around it. And if we can collaborate in the way that we've done for justice or early years or culture, as Joan Whittle, uh, sorry, Joe McAlpin has, has mentioned, uh, that's, a, that's a whole new creation uh, I have just produced. Uh, but if we can unite around this, find the points of difference and implementation as party politics will no doubt uh, encourage. But if we can at least agree around these kind of outcomes, then I think it puts us in a stronger place as a yeah. country Come and as a close, parliament please. to deliver the kind of society we want and the public consultation has suggested they want to. Uh, call on Monica Lennon to wind up the debate on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Um, a wee bit of brevity would be appreciated uh, up towards decision time, if that were possible. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. You've been very generous with your time this afternoon, which has made for an interesting debate. Um, as Deputy Convener of the Local Government and Communities Committee, I'm grateful for the chance to close the debate. And I have listened with great interest to the views of members across this wide-ranging, broadly consensual and at times poetic uh, debate, which reflects the, um, the fact that on the whole, um, I caution that on the whole, looking at you, uh, Mr Simpson, all sides of this chamber support the aspirations behind the draft national outcomes. Um, it's the first time that the Scottish Parliament has formally been consulted on the Scottish Government's draft national outcomes. And I was encouraged by the range of responses that our committee received during our call for views, especially given the very short time um, we had available, just one week over the Easter recess for stakeholders to share their views. But all of those responses helped to shape our questions to the Cabinet Secretary and informed our report's recommendations. The aspirations of the national outcomes have been broadly welcomed and the views that we received illustrated that. Though it's been said already, our call for views did raise concerns such as the wording of the overall purpose, how successfully the national outcomes align with UN Sustainable Development Goals and how some of the draft indicators can be measured. And measurement's been a theme that's been brought up many times today. But these and other issues led to the recommendations contained within our report and we look forward to the Scottish Government writing to us uh, with its views on our recommendations in due course. 
As my convener Bob Doris mentioned earlier, the scrutiny undertaken on the draft national outcomes wasn't just the job of the Local Government and Communities Committee alone, but also several different committees, many of whom have made contributions to the debate today. So I want to pay tribute to my fellow committee members, even Mr Simpson, and indeed to all of the members across the Chamber who have contributed to this scrutiny. We've heard lots of different views um, today. Um, the National Performance Framework and the outcomes mean many things to different people. Claudia Beamish talked about childhood wellbeing, Andy Whiteman about the cooperative economy. Ivan McKee and Tom Mason and others talked about process and about measurement. And Joan McAlpine talked about culture as a glue at whole society together. And I was pleased to hear Michelle Ballantyne speak about the importance of, of breastfeeding. And there's a bit of a recurring theme here. I'm going to address Mr Simpson again. But I would say that you don't have to be someone who breastfeeds to champion breastfeeding. And that should be the responsibility of everyone in this place. And we heard a lot about anoraks too. I don't self-define as an anorak. Oh, I'd be delighted to take... Graham Simpson. Um, I, I quite agree. I'm a great champion of breastfeeding, and men, men should be. Um, my, my, my own wife uh, breastfed, so you don't have to have breastfed to champion breastfeeding as uh, uh, probably the best way to feed your kids. Well, I think Lennie. it's good that we have that on the, re the record. Thank you to, to Mr Simpson. Uh, but the Cabinet Secretary touched on other issues uh, such as trade union engagement, which is very important. And what to some people has been described as waffle, concepts of love and happiness and well-being um, are very important. And yes, they are difficult to measure. I'm not quite sure we can manage love, nor should we want to. But as the Cabinet Secretary said, the, these ideas and these uh, priorities have come from many people across Scotland, including our young people, and I think it is important that that's been part of the debate today, and it's a shame that it's turned some people cold. The, um, the presiding officer was very generous with taking interventions throughout the debate, so um, a lot's been said already, which I, I won't need to, to repeat now, but in closing, um, I think it is really important we've had the opportunity to scrutinise. We've heard from James Kelly and from Willie Rennie that we need to get into the guts of this and the annual scrutiny is going to be really important. A thumbs up from Alex Cole Hamilton, so I'm doing something right today. Um, but again, if I just thank everyone across the Parliament, we didn't have a huge amount of time for scrutiny, Cabinet Secretary. It's great you've said you'll be more flexible to look at that in future. I think colleagues would welcome that. I think people across Civic Scotland would welcome that. And it is important we get this right and that the national outcomes are embedded across the public sector. We've heard from the, the audit, uh, public audit committee and from Audit Scotland that we're not seeing that evidence, particularly in the recent annual report from Scottish Enterprise, which didn't mention the national uh, uh, performance framework. But I know that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has said that he'll be holding a high level event, I'm sure. We'll all be very interested to see what that will entail. And again, can I thank everyone who's made a contribution uh, to this important scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the report on the consultation on the Scottish Government's draft national outcomes. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motion 12432 on committee membership and 12433 on committee substitution? Moved together. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we turn to decision time. The first question is that motion 12324 in the name of Bob Doris on report on the consultation on the Scottish Government's draft national outcomes be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next motion, the next question, beg your pardon, is that motion 12432 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 12433 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau on committee substitution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. Thank you very much and I close this meeting.